Um, I was very honored to receive the invitation because I absolutely love talking about historical newspapers. They are amongst my favorite source for genealogy information. Um, before I start the presentation, I want to point out that I do have the PowerPoint and the handout online on my website. So there's a URL on the slide, and it's also on your handout, where you can download it later for your own use or share it with others. Please feel free to share broadly and share widely. So to give you some, I had a great question. Someone asked me, well, why newspapers? How did you get into doing this? This is not what you do professionally. So it goes back to when I started doing my own family history and genealogy. I started about 14 years ago. And very quickly on, I realized the value of using historical newspapers. And I was um, able to benefit from having others who have taken their volunteer time to find records, make indexes, post them online for people like me to use for free. So I reached a point where I felt like I wanted to give back, and that's how I became involved in the, in the US GenWeb project. I wanted to give back. So here I am in Nashville with TSLA in my backyard. So I thought, well, why don't I go see what TSLA has and see what information might be in the collections that I can put online for others to use. So I started doing that. I started coming here and focused in on newspapers because of the challenges of accessing historical newspapers. I wanted to just make that available for others. So I started posting material online that I would draw from the newspaper collections here. So I want to share an email that I received shortly after I started doing this. This is an email I received from a woman who wrote, I am writing you in regards to an article that was posted in the Nashville Globe, which mentioned my great great uncle, Nelson Mary. I was very fortunate that his daughter's married names were listed in the article. So the Nashville Globe is an African-American newspaper that was published here in Nashville, and the article she's referring to was a newspaper write-up of Nelson Mary's wife, Mary. Now, Nelson Mary was the first ordained black pastor here in Nashville, and the newspaper article was a description of his wife's 70th birthday party. And so because of that, me posting that online, this relative was able to further her research on them because the article included the daughter's married names. So I posted this in December of 2006. She found it just a few months later, and I was continuing to get people emailing me saying thank you for sharing this information. So that just reaffirmed my commitment to want to do this. And so I started several projects to index newspapers and post them online. So this is how I got into focusing so much on historical papers. So as I thought about how to structure the talk today, I wanted to divide this up into three components. So we'll first talk about why newspapers, why are they valuable as a resource. Then I have some strategies that I use as I'm working with historical papers that we I wanted to talk about in case there might be a few tips in there that you can apply to your own process. And then I have a particular step-by-step -step approach that I've put together that helps with narrowing the, narrowing the focus when it comes time to look at a particular newspaper and start using it. So I wanted to share that as well. So this is what we'll talk about today. And I do know that my talk is a little bit over an hour, so I'm probably about an hour and 15 minutes just to give you a heads up. <laughs> so whenever I'm asked to share or I start talking about my enthusiasm for historical papers, my response generally comes down to one broad sentiment. What do you think that sentiment is? It's like finding gold. I mean, sometimes the information you can locate in a paper is just an incredible, enriching source for your family history and understanding the lives and experiences of your ancestors or whoever you're researching. This is because newspapers publish many different types of content. So if I were to start asking you to share with me what kind of content can you find in newspapers, what would some, I would like you to all start just naming the type of content we can find. Just, Birth and deaths and marriages, what else? Anniversary. Scandals, anniversaries. Accident, Accident. What'd, you, what'd you say? Business, Business information. Maybe real estate. Real estate, precisely. Obituaries, court cases, right? We could do this all day. <laughs> because newspapers contain so many types of information, so much so that that question almost becomes what types of, con not what types of content can you find, but what types of content can't you find. They publish about so many different things. Additionally, 
Using a historical newspaper is like jumping into a time machine. Do we have any Doctor Who fans in the audience? Oh, great. <laughs> I have to admit, I've only seen maybe one or two episodes, but my husband Kalanji and my daughter are fans. I've been to a Doctor Who convention. I've even knitted a Doctor Fourth scarf for my husband. So I'm familiar with the basic tenets of the show. And we can't all be time lords and hop into our TARDIS, right, to go back in time. But newspapers certainly give us a perspective about what um, individuals experience back at a time when we're not able to actually be there in person. So let's take a fun trip back in time ourselves. The year is 1975. Who is this man? Lee Majors. Lee Majors. So this is a picture from an episode of his television show, The Six Million Dollar Man. Particularly, it is an episode that aired in May 1975 and the name of the episode was Taneha. My mother saw this episode six weeks before I was born and decided she liked the name, and this is where my name comes from. <laughs> so in the episode, he's chasing or hunting down this cougar named Taneha that he's trying to save. Now my mother misremembered the spelling, so I have a Y instead of an H. But just last night, I decided to search and see if I could find a newspaper mention of when the show aired, because that's actually been a question in my mind about when the show actually aired. So I was able to confirm it came on six weeks before I was born. So I love my name. I love that I have a newspaper clipping that I can use as I document the story of my name, because I do family history scrapbooking as well. So I'll be adding this clipping to my documentation about my name. Just on a side note, I got to meet Lee Majors a couple years ago <laughs> <laughs> at a comic convention. And I was able to share with him the story of my name, and he said, oh, you have a good name. <laughs> so he signed for me. I have my baby picture, and in my baby picture, I'm holding my name, right? And he signed that for me, so that was cool. All right, so back to the more practical value for the information we can get from newspapers, I wanna highlight a few examples. So here's an obituary that was published in Fayetteville Observer in 1924, and it's an obituary for Judge Jesse Willis Bonner. And his obituary was actually eight paragraphs long. It was a quite a nice size obituary, and there's a lot of information in it. We learn, of course, the date of his death and the time. He died at eight o'clock in the morning. It has his wife's name and their children. All the names are there. We learn when and where he was born. It talks about his family having moved from Fayetteville to Nashville, even though they lived on 8th Avenue. His father's name and occupation is given. It tells us what college he attended. We learn the name of his business partner and some of his business history. It includes the name of his first wife, who was Fanny Campbell. She was daughter of Governor William Campbell, so obviously a family of some uh, preeminence. It has the names of her siblings, including married names of her uh, sisters. And for Judge Bonner, it lists his living and deceased siblings, and again, his sister's married name. So there's a lot of detail packed into this obituary. Now we can't all be so fortunate to have eight paragraph obituaries, um, but I also, also wanted to point out the information we can get from even the shortest of notices. This was published in 1882 in Manchester Times, and you can't read it as blurry, so I'll read it for you. Mrs. Isaac Van Zant of Maxwell is visiting her daughter, Mrs. S.A. Cross of our town. So as I read just these two lines, a few questions come to mind. One, is Van Zant the married name of Mrs. S.A. Cross? Her and her mom have two different surnames. Also, her mom is coming from Maxwell, which is south of Manchester, it's 45 miles away. So is this where Mrs. S.A. Cross is from? So even these two lines gives you clues for further investigation. Now being the good genealogist that I am, I had to go look it up. <laughs> and I learned that Van Zant was not her maiden name. Her mom had remarried. And I'm not sure if Mrs. S.A. Cross was from Franklin County, but that's where she's buried. She's buried there, her husband is buried there, her mom is buried there, her stepfather is buried there, and they're in the Van Zant Cemetery in Franklin County. So there must be some connection. So if you were researching this family and you even came across just those two lines, there's information that can be gleaned. Now, we can also get insight into feelings, sentiments, and sometimes emotions from newspaper reporting. This is another obituary, it's for Judge Hickerson, who, and this was published April 1882, and he died at 1.30 in the morning on April 18th. The notice indicates, a rather striking coincidence is noticeable upon the examination of the two tombstones standing hard by the grave of this once distinguished man. To his right is his wife, she died April 17th, 1881. To his left is his daughter. She died April 17th, 
1876. And the obituary notes that he had a presentiment that he would not live past the 17th and that he wanted to live that long and no longer because that was the day his wife and his daughter had died. And you see, he just made it out of April 17th, dying early morning, April 18th. So to be able to get a capture of the feelings that he was experiencing and what he was thinking at the time is something that you, you may not get otherwise. Here's a legal notice that was published in the, a paper in Sparta, Tennessee um, in 1854. This is a court notice for a neighboring DeKalb County, so it's not even the same county. And it's a court case involving Presley Adamson and William Adamson. And in the description, there are several minors listed. And the article tells you that Anna, Allen, Joseph, and Alexander Stikes are residents of Missouri. So they're non-residents of Tennessee, and it tells you where they're living. That could be a clue. And there are additional minors listed. The whole family, William, Louisa, Thomas, Jesse, Presley, Julia Ann, James, Elkanah, Asia, Melissa, and John. And they're minors, and the article, the notice talks about them having been appointed a guardian ad litem. So we are able to capture details about this family and their children um, as far back as 1854. Newspapers can also give us insight into things that you may not capture otherwise. This was published in September 1854, and I thought it was rather interesting. So in the first paragraph, we learn that on July 10th, Patrick Welch marries Miss Sarah E. Davies. A couple of weeks later, Patrick dies on July 24th. A couple of weeks after that, Sarah marries again. <laughs> So within a span of a month, Sarah has married, lost her husband, and married again. <laughs> now, if you were to look at her marriage notice, maybe it says that she was a Mrs. and had been married before, maybe not. So this might be a clue for someone investigating this family to know that she had a first husband. I did take a quick look at online trees and didn't find anyone who had her with a first husband. So, I will probably post this to share with others because I want the information to get out there. Then, of course, we have situations where there's record loss because of fires or other natural disasters. The Tennessee State Library and Archives has a web page that lists all the counties in Tennessee that have been affected by record loss due to fires and disasters. We have 95 counties in Tennessee. 71% of them have had record loss due to fire or disasters. So it's a, very, it's a very high chance that if you're researching in Tennessee, you may be researching in a county that has possible gaps in their record set. So newspapers can help fill in the gaps. Another well-known gap we have is the 1890 census. So newspapers can be incredibly valued for filling in gaps. I mean, I even had um, one person who emailed me after I posted an article just saying a woman went to go visit her son in DC, and this was in North Carolina. And he wrote to me and said, that was incredible because I was able to confirm she was living there. It was right around 1890. He didn't know when she'd moved, so he was able to at least place her in position at that time and then narrow down the gap for when she moved. So, like I said, the smallest of notices can yield insight. So that's just some of the reasons why newspapers are valuable. Again, it's like striking gold sometimes. So let's talk about some strategies for using newspapers. And I have a few that I want to go through, and your handout has links to other sites that have additional strategies and more descriptions of some of these. So the first um, approach that I like to share when talking about newspapers is to think regionally. I've been working with issues of a paper out of Jellicoe, the Advanced Sentinel, and as you see, Jellicoe is right on the state line between Tennessee and Virginia. And as I'm reading through the paper, it becomes quickly apparent the coverage that the paper has. So there's reports of people's activity uh, in Williamsburg, reports of activity down in Knoxville, reports of activity to the east and to the west. So there's a wide range that the paper covers. So that's important to keep in mind. I think this image really helps um, demonstrate and solidify just how important it is to think regionally. This is a site that was created out of a project at NTSU where a researcher went through issues of the Nashville Globe, the paper I mentioned earlier, from 1907 to 1918 and made a map of all the communities that had news reported in the Nashville paper. And you see this map spreads across the entire state. So the Nashville Globe paper was reporting African-American activity all over the state. And this is helpful because as a minority population, like other minorities, we're not always as represented in some of the historical papers around this time. So if you're an African-American in Tennessee, 
no matter where you are, you will want to check out what's in the Nashville Globe. But yes, do you have a question? Um, yes, I do. Um, is 1907 to 1918 the years that the Globe was published? It started in 1907. It was published until the 1960s. You can find online, and we'll talk about finding online papers later, but online it goes up to about 1918. Yes, sir. I noticed that East Tennessee is very scarce. Is that because there just weren't that many African Americans? Probably not as, yeah, not as much distributed in that area. Think regionally. Don't focus on just the paper where your family lived. Think about finding larger cities around that may have reports from those communities. So let's play a game of Jeopardy. Here's the answer. This community in Middle Tennessee sounds like a city in Canada. Who wants to ring that buzzer? Yes. Quebec. You get the prize. The question is, what is Quebec? So I put this in here to make a point. When you're looking at historical newspapers, there will be communities mentioned. And if you don't know where the community is, yes, you can go to Google and put in the community and maybe figure out where it's located. But what if the community is no longer in existence? You can use a gazetteer to research the community. So there's one particular site that I like to use. It's called the Hometown Locator. And they have a site for every state where you can put in the name of the community. And even if it's no longer around, it will tell you where it was at and give you some historical information about it. Now this, yes. It's the Hometown Locator. Hometown Locator. You can just put that in Google. Hometown Locator. And it will come right on up. Of course, TSLA has great gazetteers in the collection here, so if you're here on site, you can ask the staff to help you pull historical gazetteers that can also tell you where these communities were around the state. All right, another strategy that I like to use is to understand the organization of a paper. When I was in the 10th grade, um, I remember very clearly in my e economics class, we had a financial advisor come in with an issue of the Wall Street Journal and he explained to us how you read the Wall Street Journal, how it's laid out, how it's organized, how they do those famous uh, dot drawings that they're known for, how to read the stock information in the back. We spent a class session learning about the layout and the anatomy of the Wall Street Journal because that is what helps you learn to read it. Same principle applies with papers um, all over the place. So I make an effort to understand the organization and structure of the newspapers, particularly at, at different time spans. So in the late 1800s, I have some examples here of Manchester Times, and I want to talk about the structure of the Manchester Times. So page one was generally a focus on national news in the first co couple columns and then ads. So if you're looking for an advertisement, you could look on page one. The second page, the first couple columns tended to have political items, some local news, and then the rest of the page tended to be regional news and ads. Now page three is where we really get the meat of the local news. This is where they would put the society columns, the marriages, the deaths, who's visiting who, who went on a flying trip to Beach Grove for business. When I first read flying trip, I was like, what is that? It's just a quick trip. <laughs> so there's terminology involved. We'll talk about that as well. So page three, I quickly began to understand was where I could focus. And then page four tended to not have items of local news. This is where you would see maybe um, religious sermons uh, redistributed or advice columns or Mr. Johnson from Nebraska saying he drank that potion and it cured his heart. So medical as as well. So if I'm looking for news in Manchester Times around this time period, I can quickly focus in on just a couple of pages. And this is helpful if you're using the microfilm. And even with the nice scanners they have, you're still going page by page. So it helps you narrow your focus. Now, newspapers evolve over time, so this is another example of moving forward in time to the 1930s, again with the advanced Sentinel, and by this time, papers started to have more pages, so with five, six, seven, eight pages instead of four pages that they would earlier. And the news tended to be spread out more broadly across the issue, although I did notice fairly often that page three was often a full page ad. So you could just skip right over page three unless you were looking for an ad and saw your person of interest mentioned. And then, of course, now we have papers that are very structured. We have the legend on the front page that tells you obituaries are on page B5. So understanding the structure of the paper can help you as you use it. Then there's terminology, because 
Different time period, different terminology is used. Who knows what the word instant means? Whatever day I mentioned, that's where he That's exactly that's what happened. No. <laughs> in this month. Instant means in this month. As opposed to um, ultimo, which is last month. And so there's a whole terminology that's used. Communicated means it was written by someone other than the newspaper staff. This is important because we've talked about these local communities were sending news. Sometimes they were written by someone in the community and then sent to the paper. And I've been tripped up by this before too. The date could be different. So if the paper was published on the 18th, the person sent in their notice maybe the 15th, and they mentioned something happening today, it wasn't the 18th, it was the 15th. So you need to pay attention to the terminology like this and understand it. Um, so if, some, if the paper's published February 8th and it says Mrs. Johnson died on the second Ultimo, when did she die? January 2nd, not February 2nd. So that's why it's important to pay attention. And I have resources again on your handout that describe these terms and others that are helpful for your newspaper research. I got sick back in December and I was in the midst of all this newspaper, and I made a newspaper joke on Facebook. <coughs> I said, my current situation, if it was an 1890s newspaper, Mrs. Kalanji McClellan is on the sick list. We wish her a speedy recovery. And then my friend said, oh no, hopefully you'll be seen out again soon, as they used to say, because you see certain language used over and over again. But I put this up here to make a point about naming conventions. So back in the day, women were often referred to by their husband's name, not their own names. So that's important to keep in mind. I'm not Tania McClellan, I'm Mrs. Kalaji McClellan. Now sometimes if the husband passed away, it would be Mrs. Tania McClellan. They would use the first name. But it's important to keep that in mind, that women were often referred to by the husband's name. Also, there's name variations and abbreviations. So understanding that works for newspapers just like it does for any other genealogy document. WM for William, JNO for John, JAS, which I guess could be either James or Jason. I'm, you know, there, there are conventions that are used. James. I think when I first started, I thought it was Jason. So, because I, I didn't quite understand all the naming conventions. So you don't want to make misinterpretations. All right, so that's just a few. Um, there's, again, there's more on the handout. And I want to spend the rest of the time now talking about finding newspapers. And this is where we really get to what TSLA offers. Because we now understand how valuable they are. There are some strategies that we can apply for using them. Let's talk about how we find newspapers, particularly here at TSLA, what we have to offer here, and how you use them. So I have a three-step approach that I'll go through um, to describe this process. First. We'll talk about how do you identify which paper to look in. And then, how do you find out if someone's done some work for you that will help you? Are there indexes, abstracts, or transcriptions that you can rely on, or at least use before you go to the source? And then, isn't it great if you can find out if it's digitized and you can access it online? So how do you um, learn which papers are made available in a digital format? So the Tennessee State Library and Archives, if you go to the main website, on the History and Genealogy page, they make it very easy for you to get to the information about newspapers. On the sidebar, there's a section called Newspapers, Manuscripts, and Microfilm. So you'll go there and click on the link that says Newspapers. When you go to that page, there are several <coughs> items listed. We're going to focus in on the Newspapers on Microfilm at TSLA page, which is right in the center of the page. And when you go there, it presents you with information about how you can identify what newspapers TSLA has on microfilm. As Virginia said, TSLA has the largest collection of Tennessee newspapers on microfilm, and it's such an incredible resource. So when you go to this page, you have options. You can browse by title. So if I know I want the Nashville Globe, I can just go to the end and see what TSLA has in their collections. But I find it often more helpful to understand uh, publication patterns geographically. So I really like the um, communities arranged by county link, which I didn't highlight on the slide, but it's right in the middle of the screen. Because when you go to the arrangement by county, the cities are listed by the county in which they're located, and you can see what papers exist for any one of them. So this is an example where we're looking at Shelbyville. And when you click on it, you get a list of all the papers that we know have been published in Shelbyville and their publication time frame and their frequency of publication. So if we look at something like the Bedford County Sun, that was published between 1949 and 1972. 
Now, this, this list does not mean TSLA has all these issues. So you need to go to the online catalog to see if what issues TSLA actually has. So there's a link at the top that lets you do that to check the online catalog. So I want to go to the catalog and take a look and see what newspapers and issues TSLA has. So here's an example of the results you get back. Um, and this is just the first two results. There's a total of 31 that are retrieved. And if we look at a particular record, so we'll look at the second one. And I'm not sure how you pronounce this, the revile. And so when you look at this record, you see that TSLA actually only has one issue. And it's, it's hard to read for those in the back, but down here, there's a D4-1862. December 4th, 1862 is the one issue they have of this paper. And they also tell you that it's filmed with the Shelbyville commercial. So that means it's on the same reels downstairs as the Shelbyville commercial. So it gives you an indication of where to go to actually see the microfilm. I know, it's hard to read. Sorry, sorry for that. But they have the one issue of that paper. And every paper will have different holdings. So this is great if you're looking for a Tennessee newspaper. And I also wanted to give some tips for what to do if you're looking outside of Tennessee. So to that end, where is this place? It's the Library of Congress. So the Library of Congress has a fabulous resource that helps us identify which papers have been published around the country. It came about as a result of a program that started in 1982 called the United States Newspaper Program. This is a collaboration between the National Endowment for Humanities and the Library of Congress where their strategy was to locate, catalog, and microfilm as many U.S. newspapers as could be uh, identified and located. So the National Endowment for Humanities was the funding arm and the Library of Congress provided the technical assistance and developed standards for the microfilm so that we could be sure we had the best quality we could capture. So they created a database of bibliographic records and this is, at this point, just records, information about the newspapers. And so the database has more than 150,000 titles across the country. It's hosted on the Chronicling America website. And when you go to the site, there's a purple button in the top corner that takes you to the US newspaper directory. This is the database we're talking about, 1690 to present. You can search this directory to identify what papers were published where across the country, and you can see which libraries hold the paper of interest. So this is the search screen, and like many search screens, you have options. You can browse by title, or you can search by location. You can specify a time range, and then you can do several specialty searches as well. They have labeled each paper as relevant by ethnic groups. So if I'm looking for African American newspapers, I can select that. They have labeled papers by labor press. These are businesses and trades. So if I'm looking for newspapers geared towards the farming community, I can do that. So they have several options here to allow you to hone in on finding a particular newspaper of interest. So here I'm doing a search. I want to identify and find what newspapers were published in Coffee County, Tennessee. When I do that, I'm presented with a list of results. Um, this particular search has 32 results. And then I have a list. And if we look at any particular title, it tells you the name, the location, and the time range. Now, question marks represent uncertainty because we may not exactly know the exact years of publication of a paper, but they were trying to identify as much as they can. If we look at Manchester Times, for example, we get several pieces of information about it. They're telling us who the publisher was when it started, Fielden and Miller, and I definitely saw his name all over the paper. Um, frequency, subjects, and they're even in the notes field giving you a history um, of its printing um, publication status. And the very last link on this page takes you to the holdings information. So there's a link that says view complete holdings information. When you click on that link, it then tells you, and I love the name of this page, libraries that have it. Very straightforward, very simple. No misinterpreting it, libraries that have it. Well, the first library is Coffee County Manchester Public Library. It makes sense. This is a Coffee County newspaper. And to help you interpret what you're seeing, they give you the years, so 1890, and then they tell you the month and the dates of the issues they have. So the second entry that I've highlighted indicates that the Coffee County Library has the October 31st, November 14th, and November 21st issues from 1890. If you keep scrolling down the page, you see other libraries that have it. So TSLA is obviously there. TSLA has this in the collection. 
as well as the University of Kentucky at Lexington. And I point this out because if I'm in Lexington and I want to research the Coffee County newspaper, I might think I need to come to Tennessee. Well, no. University of Kentucky Lexington has issues, so I can stay nearby and access that paper. So it's helpful to take a look and see what libraries have microfilm of the newspapers you're looking for. All right, so I've mentioned that I like information laid out on a map because I'm very, I guess, spatially oriented. So there's another site I want to bring to your attention. This is called Journalism's Voyage West, and there is a link to it on the handout. This is done by a group out of Stanford. And what they have done is taken that database I just showed you, the newspaper database, and mapped it to a map of the United States. So you can go to the site and identify papers geographically by visual uh, representation. There's a slider across the top because it lets you go to any specific year. So if I am, for example, trying to fill in gaps around the loss of the 1890 census, I can move the slider over to 1890 and see exactly what papers were published in this country in 1890. So I'm gonna zoom in to Tennessee, and then you see they have these circles. So the bigger the circle means the more publications. So we see a big circle around Nashville, a big circle around Memphis, makes sense. Larger cities, more publications. But I'm looking for Coffee County, so let me keep narrowing in. And I get to the one little circle for Coffee County, and it presents me with Manchester Times. So now I know Manchester Times is a paper I can look in around this time period for information in 1890. When you click on the link to Manchester Times, it takes you right back to the Library of Congress database we just looked at. So they're connected, it's just the information is presented in a visual way rather than a list. So I just, I think this is very helpful to know about. So the whole point of identifying the paper is because when we're ready to go down to the microfilm downstairs, you know exactly where to go, which drawer to go to, and access the paper that TSLA has on microfilm. This is just a picture of Campbell County papers. All right, so we've talked about how to identify the paper of interest. Now, how do you know if someone has done some work for you already? Is there an index to this paper? Are there abstracts that have been printed on this paper? Has anyone bothered to transcribe things from this paper? I wanna talk about a process we can use to figure that out because if someone's done some work for you, it may not be perfect, but again, it helps you focus and be more specific when you go to the original source. First, let's talk about some terminology. What's the difference between an index, an abstract, and a transcription? So an index is very basic usually. It's just a list of names and a citation, like the day of the paper and the page an obituary, for example, appeared on. But it helps you in referring to the original. An abstract goes a step further. An abstract gives you the name, the citation, but will also include gleanings from what's in the original publication um, that helps you, for example, differentiate. It may provide the names of the spouses. It may provide the names of the children. So if there's two entries in the, in the publication for W.A. Johnson, well, if it gives me the spouse and the children's name, I can help me figure out which W.A. Johnson I may need to look at. So that can be very helpful. Then there are transcriptions. Now, this is obviously the most labor intensive because it's literally a word for word copy of what was published in the paper. So you don't see as many of those in print, but they definitely um, do exist. I keep wanting to turn around and go over here. All right, so when you're looking for a publication, we have a beautiful reading room downstairs that's organized generally by county. And so if you want to identify if there have been any published works that have done some of this work for you, you can just go directly to the county section and look. So I did that one day. My husband has family in Montgomery County, and I went to the Montgomery County section, and lo and behold, there's this wonderful set of books that has um, abstracts compiled from 1810 to 1948. That's quite a range. So it helps me before I need to go to the newspaper in identifying where to go and seeing if maybe the person I'm looking for is mentioned. And another example, uh, we have the Shelbyville Gazette down in Bedford County. You go to the Bedford County section, there's a whole range of obituary um, material that someone has taken the time to go through the paper from 1900s to uh, 2000. So there's quite a bit of work represented in these books. There are also books that are not necessarily county specific, but include a broader um, geographic area. And those are at the beginning of the floor, when, on to your, um, this is my left, to your left as you walk in. And so the staff downstairs can help you in locating which books are available by county. 
to help you identify has someone done some of this work already. Now the formats of what you'll see are vary. Um, <laughs> I have a Kuntz surname project, so I started doing my Kuntz genealogy, became interested in Kuntz's genealogy, and now I research Kuntz's all over the country. And so this is an extract from one of the books I showed you on the previous screen where there's an entry for Mrs. Selena Kuntz, and we have details about where she lived, um, when she died, and her family, as opposed to the Shelbyville Gazette books, which are literally clipping some of the newspaper that she put into, uh, made pages for a book, and she has an index in the back. So in this case, I get the whole newspaper <coughs> clipping. So the formats will vary. It's really interesting to see. Now, if you're not physically here in the building, you can <coughs> identify books using the catalog. So if you go to the TSLA catalog, which there's a search box on every page in the top corner, you can enter some quick and dirty keywords to try and identify books that have done this. So examples include obituaries, Tennessee, and the county of your choice, death notices, Tennessee, and the county of your choice, or newspapers, Tennessee, and the county of your choice, because you can search the catalog to see if there are publications. Now again, this is quick and dirty. There are more sophisticated ways to do this, and the staff can help you. But for example's sake, I just wanted to show this. So here I've done a search for obituaries, Tennessee, Bedford, and I get back several results. Obituaries of our ancestors as transcribed from the Shelbyville Gazette. Shelbyville Gazette obituaries. Bedford County, Tennessee, wills and vital records from newspapers. So now I've identified several books where individuals have taken the time to go through a wide range of years on this pa these papers and try to extract them and publish them so I can rely on those. Now, another great source for finding published works with extracts or indexes or abstracts for obituaries is on FamilySearch website, FamilySearch Books. FamilySearch, you may know, is um, run by the Church of Latter-day Saints, and they have an online database of more than 350,000 digitized genealogy and family history books from libraries across this country. Now, it does require registration to use the FamilySearch website, but it's a free registration. And when you go here, you can search and identify publications. And this is digitized, full text PDF documents. And some of them you'll be able to access from home. Some of them you have to be at a family search library or an affiliate library to access. The good news is TSLA is in the process of finalizing being an affiliate library. So if you're using this site at home and you find something you can't use, you'll be able to come to TSLA. You have a question. Is that why a lot of times I've noticed but once it's done, because not only will you be able to access materials here, there's a ton of other materials you'll be able to access by being on site. So let's do a quick and dirty search here. Obituaries, Tennessee. And you can see some of the results that come back. Obituaries of Williamson County. Obituaries of Grundy County, two volumes. Obituary of Giles County, two volumes. So there's definitely content here that we can get to. Now let's look at the example of the first one. Early obituaries of Williamson County. When you open it up, it's a 153-page PDF document, and my best guess is there are probably about 1,500 obituaries that Louise Lynch abstracted, and it covers 1839 to 1899. She's got a, a legend that tells you the abbreviations for which paper she's referring to. The bulk of the content is represented here in the middle, where it's organized by surname, tells you the name of the person who died, and she's abstracted information from the published obituary. So this is an abstract then in this index at the back. So if you're researching the Brooks family, for example, there are four pages where there are Brooks mentioned. You can go to those pages. So what a wonderful resource to have available to you at home. So that's just, it's nice to know about. All right. I am the state coordinator of the Tennessee Gen Web Project. I have to talk about the Tennessee Gen Web Project. So the Tennessee Gen Web Project is designed to provide free genealogy resources for every county in Tennessee. We are run by a group of volunteers, so I have the fortune of working with about 60 or so different volunteers to help coordinate these state sites. Jim Long is here, and he is our coordinator from Montgomery County. And so our goal is to provide you with resources, and as much as we can do for free, we do. So our county sites may include death notices and obituaries. So I want to point out particularly Montgomery County, Jim's site, and here, he's got links to several places online where there are indexes to um, obituaries. One of them is the published index to that set of, of books that I showed you earlier, the, ten vo the multiple volumes that covers 1810 and 1938. They're called the Ganaway books because Ganaway was the name of the individual who put them together. 
So here downstairs we have the books and Jim links out to the indexes posted online. So I don't even have to physically be here to see the indexes for these books. So that's great to have. Another example, I do the site for Blount County and we have a volunteer who contributed publications that he did where he indexed 28,000 obituaries from Blount County covering 1867 to 1960. So we have the whole index posted on the site. So if you're researching anyone in Blount County during this time period, you want to know about this index. And so when you go to the index, you see the person's name, the age if it's included in the obituary, the date it was published, and the newspaper that it was published in. Wonderful finding aids to the resources here at TSLA where they actually have the microfilm issues. In fact, some of this is now digitized, but we'll talk about digitization later. And I also want to share one of my pet projects that I'm doing for the Tennessee Gym Web. Uh, I started a site called the Historical News Index where I come to TSLA, pull uh, microfilm newspapers, and abstract them to post online. Um, I'm focusing on papers right now that are not available any other way. Um, and I um, have been putting this together and starting the process now of recruiting volunteers to help. So what this is is a database of abstracts. It, there's about 3,200 entries. I have revamped the way I approach this. At first, I started with transcriptions, but we talked about how labor-intensive transcriptions are. And I wanted to provide access to more. So I reduced it now to just have an abstract. And you can search the database by the person's given name, by the surname, the brief detail search box lets you search the text of what's abstracted. I take each abstract and categorize it by county. So the earlier notice I showed you of Mrs. Van Zant from Maxwell coming to visit her daughter in Manchester, that I have mapped to both Franklin and Coffee County. And I also map it to type. So is it a, a notice about a death, about a marriage? Is it a society column? Is it a criminal activity? So I'm categorizing the abstracts and then you can also select by paper. Um, this is a view of one of the results we get back. So this is searching Coffee County. And for Coffee County, I've abstracted maybe about eight months of newspapers from 1882. And when you go to the results, we see the first set of results is for one individual, G.W. Cross. It's amazing the picture you can get about a person's life when you can see a larger picture. Because within this six month time period, G.W. Cross went to Beach Grove on legal business. He got married. He was in a case against J.C. Jernigan for killing pigs. He signed a request for a musical performance from a young lady in the community. His mom came to visit him. She was com coming from Scarborough. He moved his business office, and he had a real estate transfer. So all this within six months we can capture from having an abstract and make it available online. This is a detail record. Um, there's a link on the previous page to view details. So now I'll skip to a different individual. This is his name. This is a man named J.M. Cook. He was killed, and this is the notice of his death. So we're including the article title, brief detail. Um, again, here's the type. It was about a death in Campbell County, the newspaper, the Advanced Sentinel. We provide the issue. We provide the location. And there's a notes field, because sometimes as we're abstracting this text, we're learning about the individual. So had this been about Mrs. S.A. Cross, I know her name. So I may put that in the notes as an editorial note, because I know her name and I want to provide that to you as a user. And we also have a link to see more, because this is another piece that we just started doing. We are using a platform called Kindex to provide the clipping of the original notice, and volunteers can come online and transcribe it. So what happens is, as we get this rolling, we'll be able to link out to the full text that's transcribed, and when it's transcribed, it becomes search engine accessible. And so that will help with discovery as well. So we're, I'm starting to put together again this process to have contributors. So if you're interested in transcribing, let me know. And when you have the transcription, you can download it as a PDF and you can share this online with others. So I'm excited to be exploring this as a possible platform. And again, we're pulling from papers here at TSLA that are not otherwise accessible. Another component we have on the site is I've started a map, because again, I think spatially, to help you see where our coverage is at any moment in time. So we've indexed or abstracted six papers, uh, one in Lincoln County, Coffee County, White County, and Campbell County. So you can get a feel for where our focus is. And if you click on any of the icons, 
we're providing details of which papers are included. And we also have a page of research resources, and I want to point out one I just put up last night, um, a listing of published works with indexes and abstracts. Because when you go to that page, I've started a list. It needs to be worked on, um, so I'll probably try to crowdsource this. So if there's any resource that you use, let me know. But I'm trying to create a list organized by county of published books with indexes and abstracts of newspapers. So that way you have one place you can go to get to that. Now in Tennessee, we are just one of the United States Genware Project. So if you're researching outside of Tennessee, it's worth exploring the other state sites as well. Again, all freely available and helps you identify if someone has done the work on that paper that can help you. I also want to briefly mention deathindexes.com. Um, this is a free site that's also done by a volunteer. His name is Joe, all by himself. He collates links to resources where there are indexes to help you find where deaths would be. So you can't read the individual listings here, I know. I just wanted to point it out as a place to go because he's got it organized by state and by county as well. Again, the idea is that if you find an index or an abstract book, you know exactly where to go when you go downstairs to use the microfilm. But wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to use microfilm, <laughs> if you could use a digital uh, version of the newspaper. So let's talk about how do we find out if your newspaper has been digitized. I talked earlier about the United States Newspaper Program in the Library of Congress, and that was phased out around 2011 because it morphed into the National Digital Newspaper Program. And the goals of the National Digital Newspaper Program is to build on top of the directory, not only have information about the newspapers, but the digital versions of those newspapers as well. And how much content are we talking about? Well, the way they set it up was the idea was that each state could apply for funding in three cycles. Each cycle, you were to digitize 100,000 pages. So by the time you finished all three cycles, your state would have contributed 300,000 digitized newspaper pages. Content spans 1790 to 1963, depending on some copyright considerations. And so far, 46 states and one territory have contributed digital versions of newspapers to the database. There are currently more than 14 and a half million digital pages from more than 2,700 newspapers on the Chronicling America site. Now in Tennessee, we participated and we started in 2010, the TSLA partnered with the University of Tennessee to digitize Tennessee newspapers. And we had the three cycles. So the first cycle focused on Civil War and Reconstruction era newspapers. The second phase focused on 1870s and 1900. And the third phase focused on 1915 to 1922. Um, I was actually fortunate to be part of the advisory committee to help choose newspapers, and it was very exciting to see it as it progressed, to see the content being selected, to see the pages being digitized, and to see them online and made available. Um, it's no longer active, but there is a website where you can get the historical perspective on the project. So Tennessee has now contributed um, 125 you did contributed pages from 125 newspapers, and they're included on the Chronicling America website. So we were here earlier in the presentation because we talked about the, the purple button in the top, the directory, but this is where you can also go to get the digitized content. And there's a tab called All Digitized Newspapers that you can go to. You can also search and focus in on your state. So here's the listing for Tennessee. I have this URL bookmarked because I come here a lot. And you get a list of all the papers that have been digitized from Tennessee. It tells you the name of the paper, the years that it was published. You can browse issues using a calendar view that it will show you. You see how many issues have been published. So looking at Athens Post, they've digitized 830 issues of this newspaper from 1849 to 1874. So that's a nice time period um, to have available to you digitally. You can click on the yes to see more. And for a paper that's been digitized, not only do we get the information we saw earlier about the details of the paper, but now we have the digital content as well, along with a history, a, a descriptive history that was written about the paper. There's a link to view the issues, calendar view. And so when you go to the calendar view, you can select on the drop down menu what year. And then for every date that there was a published issue, it's hyperlinked. 
So we can immediately tell Athens Post, published weekly on Fridays. So that helps you understand which paper you can go to look at for whatever you're looking for if you know a date. Once you click on an issue, you're presented with all the pages of the paper, nice visual. Remember we said that papers around this time were about four pages, so this is not a big paper, it's four pages. And when you go to any one page, you then have controls for using it. So you can jump around pages, you can jump back and forth to issues, you can download the PDF of this page to save it for your own files, and you can even clip a file and save that. And the quality is amazing, you can zoom in and it's just excellent quality in most cases because again, there were standards for capturing this microfilm and so it makes it easier and better quality when we go to use it online. Now, not everything is this, this great quality. It depends on the quality of the original when they microfilmed it, but a lot of the papers are very good quality. You can zoom in very closely and see things very clearly. Oh, and I don't have it shown here, but at the bottom of each page, there is a URL, it's called a permalink, you can capture that URL, and the Library of Congress has made a commitment that that URL will always work. So even if they change the way they set up their website, it's a permalink. Capture it, you will always be able to use it. And it's specific to the page. So if you want to share this with someone else, you can take them directly to the page. Here are search options for the digitized content. Again, they give you multiple things you can use. You can select a state, you can focus on a particular newspaper, you can specify a date range. So I wanna use the example again of Mrs. Nelson G. Mary, her name was Mary, Mary Mary, <laughs> and I wanna look for her uh, funeral notice or her obituary. Now, being an African-American citizen in Nashville and on that time frame, I know the Nashville Globe is of interest, so I'm specifying Nashville Globe, 1917, and I put in her name, Mary Mary to which I get one result, and it is a description of her funeral service. So this might be interesting to know about and good to have. Oh, and here's the permalink. So every page will have a permalink. But let's try another way to search her name, because remember we talked about women being referred to as their husband's name. So I'm trying Mrs. Nelson Mary in this case, to which I get nothing. So I'm try a different way. Let me try Mrs. N. G. Mary, because initials were commonly used, right? Instead of using the full name, use initials, to which I get a very descriptive article about her death, a picture, if I had not had it, details about her life, details about her funeral, details about her history. It tells me she's from Sumner County. It has her parents' names. She was born enslaved, so her parents were likely enslaved. And that's detail I've not seen anywhere else. So I've since been able to share this with the lady who emailed me that I showed you earlier because it gives more detail about her background. So it's, you have to search different ways to find the content. Now having the digital material is excellent because we can search it. And I wanna point out how we're able to search it. There's a process called optical character recognition where the machines are going through the images and extracting the text. Well, we see a lot of gibberish in this OCR text, things that you can't decipher, and that will happen. So that's why we have to search different terms. That's why we have to also accompany the digital work with uh, manual work, because it's not always gonna be 100% accurate. No technique is 100% accurate, so we have to use these things in combination with each other. But it's certainly extremely helpful to have it. So let's go back to the TSA website. We've talked about Chronicling America. On their newspapers page, there's a link to a database called the 19th Century Newspapers Database. And this is a database of 200 papers that have been digitized from across the country. And there are papers in it from Tennessee, and it focuses on 19th century. So when you open up the link, you're taken to a description of the papers that are included. So there are papers digitized from Chattanooga, from Jonesboro, and from Memphis, and from Nashville. So that's a good geographic coverage. We have the east, we have the west, we have the center, we have the southeast. So it's a nice representation. And remember, these are larger cities. They're going to include information from communities in a broad region. So it's great to have access to this. Now, Jim Long gave a presentation last time for the TSLA workshop series about accessing um, election records and talked about this site. And even though TSLA says you can only use it in the library, he gave you a hint as to how you might be able to use it at home. I'm not gonna repeat it, you'll have to go watch his talk to see that. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Now, once you're in the database, you have options for searching. And this is the advanced search screen. And um, I'm going to do a search for Coots. And on this side, we can do limits. And I want to particularly point out the people, because if you click on that plus sign, it gives you an option to restrict it to death notices. So that can be helpful. And then on the other side, you can limit by date, publication title, and location. So I put in Coots in Tennessee. When I do that, I get back two results. And what it presents to me are a caption of the image. And where it's pink, that's the position on the page where my result is located. And then I can click to see the article. I can click to see the whole page. Um, so let's click through on the first one to see the actual article. And it's, it's more of a medical ad um, about a guy who's recovering. And it's coming from Gainesville, Florida. And it's written by JCB Koontz. Well, I know who he is. I've researched him. Hmm? people? Yeah, I didn't actually read the whole thing, but you know, it's a historical newspaper. So I think it gives you more vigor. Like, let's see. He suffered from rheumatism. Yeah, and that's the name of this. Dr. Williams, Pink Pills for Pale People. I don't know. I didn't research the actual. Again, we talked about these medical ads. Um, so you never know what you will find. Um, but this is the actual article and then you can click to see where it's positioned on the page. And I wanted to point this out because you can use the navigation along the side to jump around to other parts of the page. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the Tennessean. So this was done by TSLA back in the fall where they've made access to almost 200 years of content from the Tennessean and earlier papers available to all Tennessee state residents. You can access it through the Tennessee Electronic Library and it's Wonderful. When you go to the Tennessee Electronic Library and access the database, here's your search screen. So I'm just going to do a search for Nelson G. Mary. We'll go back to him. And I'll put his name in, Nelson G. Mary, and I get more than 4,000 results. And so it presents to me the newspaper items in which his name appeared. And I can also use the filters on the side to narrow by date or limit to full text if I needed to do that. So when I click on the first one, this is a notice of his funeral. He died in 1884, and it's quite descriptive. And at this point, I can save this image. I can download the PDF of this article. I can download the PDF of the whole page. So it's an incredible resource to have access to. So we've got the Chronicling America database. We've got the 19th century newspapers database that TSLA provides access to. We've got 200 years of the Tennessean that TSLA provides access to. So this is all great for Tennessee. And if you're researching other, okay, actually, no, there's one more resource I want to show you, sorry. This is a site called the Ancestor Hunt, also done by a volunteer. There's one guy named Kenneth. He goes and makes lists of all the digitized newspaper content he can find. So he's got a page for every state. So when you go to his Tennessee page, he's got them categorized. So Google has digitized newspapers. He's telling you which papers have been digitized by Google. There are student newspapers that have been digitized. He's telling you what um, student newspapers he's found. He's got them organized by major cities. So there are several papers from Chattanooga, and there's other free sites. So he, this is what he does in his spare time. He just tries to go find every single digital newspaper he can and links it on his site. So it's great to know about it. So there's so many different ways to get to know, you know what we have as digital content. So I hope that these um, approaches help you as you navigate historical newspapers. Thank you again for your time and attention.